Module 13, Relational Summary Lecture, GEE1, The Sun Also Rises. The sun rises in the east. When I visited Fukushima, Japan, years before the nuclear meltdown, we spent New Year's Eve in the land of the rising sun on an east-facing beach, following the tradition of being the first to see the sun dawn on a new year. You'd be forgiven for thinking that if you did as the Beatles song suggested and followed the sun, that such places would be great places to capture solar energy. But of course, from a biological perspective, there's nothing special about being the first nation to be bathed in sunlight. Ultimately, east or west, all countries at the same line of latitude receive the same amount of sunlight because the longitude lines separating the eastern and western hemispheres have little ecological meaning. With that said, it is still vital to understand how the distribution of countries and continents affects what Eastern tradition calls feng shui, or wind water, how it affects water and air currents and the resultant weather and climate. Now, I've claimed that the longitude lines separating the Eastern and Western hemispheres have little ecological meaning. Yes, the, the eastward spin of the Earth around its north-south axis causes the Coriolis effect that drives the winds and rotation of the ocean currents that carry heat throughout the planet. But whether a country is in the east or the west says little about how its environment will develop, which is why the vegetation in Korea bears so much resemblance to that of New York. You can rather look for meaning in the position of countries around the equator and the tropic lines of latitude, which, due to the Earth's peculiar tilt and its equatorial bulge, make the southern and northern hemisphere distributions of land masses have everything to do with the weather, with the seasons, with cold winters and hot summers and the accumulation of ice at the very real poles, which are having a tremendous influence on ocean currents and their distribution of heat and cold around the globe, and the impending sea level rise occurring as the poles melt. Now, there was a time 200 million years ago when all the continents now spread out from east to west were merged together into a supercontinent called Pangaea, and the climate was quite, quite different. According to Science Daily, quote, Pangaea was a hothouse then. Temperatures were about 20 degrees Celsius hotter in the summer, and atmospheric carbon dioxide was 5 to 20 times greater than today, end quote. The article goes on to explain that there was a rainfall gap at that time that, quote, depended on variations in the Earth's precession or the wobble on its axis coupled with the eccentricity cycle based on Earth's orbital position to the sun. Together, these Milankovitch cycles influence how much sunlight or energy reaches different areas of the planet. During the late Triassic period, the equatorial regions received more sunlight, thus more energy to generate more frequent rainfall. The higher latitudes, with less total sunlight, experienced less rain." End quote. Now what's interesting about all this is that by looking at the past climate changes long before humans walked the Earth, and assessing the CO2 levels and what we know about Milankovitch cycles, we can predict how the ecology of a region will be impacted by anthropogenic or human-caused climate change. Well, we could if we could predict how the humans of a region will be impacted by our climate disruptions and how they will react. And that, my friends, is the big X factor here, or as the New York Times put it, quote, the real threat in climate change, our behavior. You see, the so-called Earth is, as I've said, rather a rather unique saltwater covered planet with flat and pointed mountain peaks poking out of it themselves covered in a hypersea of fresh water that flows down to the salty seas or is held temporarily in the cells of multicellular and unicellular organisms and its water features and water containing life form features make it a self-regulating planet. The Gaia hypothesis of Dr. James Lovelock suggests that the Earth is a living system powered by sunlight and geothermal and rotational energy, basically heating water and air masses causing them to circulate in vortices, rising as they heat against the gravity well, and sinking as they cool, and this dynamic drives the climate. As we noted in our modules on the ecological south, the sheer amount of water in the southern hemisphere, to say nothing of the entire planet, which is 71% H2O, coupled with the current distribution of land masses and mountains, 
is responsible for the relative stability of the Earth's climate during the Holocene. But that isn't the whole story. What the Gaia hypothesis indicates is that life itself is a major regulator of the climate because, like all systems, the ecosystem tends toward its own advantage. Life creates climate. But as we've learned, when certain populations of individual species get out of kilter, they can invoke chaos. And so it is with human beings and anthropogenic climate forcing. The question going forward is, can we count on human beings to re-regulate the climate? Well, if our past actions and our reactions to the COVID pandemic are any indicator, our behavior won't change fast enough to stop the climate from irreversible change. That indeed is the perception and expectation we have here in the Northwest. But maybe that isn't the complete picture. Let's use the pandemic as a proxy. If we consider the attitude of people in the East toward wearing masks out of concern for others and themselves, and realize that they've been doing so for decades, not just as a response to COVID-19, we could be encouraged to think that a similar sense of social responsibility and the precautionary principle might also take place throughout the Eastern Hemisphere regarding climate change. My host from into USF took me on a screeningly fast, sleek, clean, and almost silent electric bullet train for a four-hour ride to one of China's new cities in the center of the country. Along the way, we passed through several new cities and many old ones, and everywhere we could see rooftops studded with vacuum tube solar hot water systems and windmills. We saw gleaming photovoltaics, and everywhere the trees. When we got into the city, I noted skyscraper housing projects that not only had the solar thermal on the roof, but had rows of photovoltaic panels under the windows on the south-facing walls. And just as I had witnessed in Shenzhen and Shanghai and Beijing previously, beautiful vegetated bike and electric scooter paths paralleled the highways, separated by rows of trees. And again, connecting the cities all along the new roads and filling them in, more trees. My host said, we have a lot of people, a lot of hands, a lot of minds, so we plant trees. You all hear about how we're building new coal plants every day to drive our growth and how this is driving climate change. But you can see now that we are also growing new trees every day and improving our public transportation and still expanding our use of bicycles, many now electric hybrid bikes and electric motorcycles. This is what the iPad equation can do at its best. When P times T includes the right technologies and includes hands planting trees, then our impact, I, should go up, but in a good way. Our ecological footprint should actually increase by increasing our ecological systems. I remember reading a promising series of essays by the legendary science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke in the 1970s at the height of America's air pollution crisis. The mantra I heard at school was that the more cars there were on the road, the more problems we would face as a society, and God forbid that sleeping giant in the East China were to wake up and start demanding their share of the limited earth pie. What if they traded in their bicycles for motor cars? Why, then we'd be in a pickle, wouldn't we? But Clark wrote about two other possibilities. The first were what he called gems, or ground effects machines, essentially hovercrafts. He pointed out, that in a world without wheels on the ground, which we might now sooner get to through drone technology than hovercraft, but they are hovercraft really, there would be no need for most of our highway repair. Who hasn't lamented how often traffic is slowed by potholes in their endless repair? And then he reasoned there also wouldn't really be any need for highways. We could float over seas of grass, or better yet, over biologically complex meadow ecologies and over water features filled with life and productivity. Why use pavement at all? The other possibility that he talked about were hydrogen cars, exploring the chemistry of hydrogen and oxygen redox. Whether we use combustion and stick with internal combustion engines or use fuel cells or go for all electric motors powered by hydrogen elsewhere, he concluded that the byproduct would simply be water vapor. He pointed out that dirty air could go in the air filter of a car or go into an engine go into a power plant and come out purified, steam cleaned if you like, and that therefore the more cars we had on the road, the cleaner the air would get. As a kid, it made the future seem bright, and I couldn't understand why we weren't all racing to this bright, big, beautiful tomorrow. Imagine, the more of us there are, the more climate solutions we would have too. 
Last May, just outside my hotel in Shanghai, I passed a Tesla dealership. It was similar to the one I'd spent time in when I was speaking at schools for National Geographic in Honolulu, Hawaii. They had every model of Tesla electric car, and they had the Tesla power wall and solar panels, and the dealership, unlike the gaudy showrooms of fossil car manufacturers, was filled with uplifting statements and flowing text over giant posters of nature's greenery and human achievements in clean energy. Imagine a car dealership that was relaxing and tranquil and beautiful, a place you went into to feel good about the future of cars and highways. And those highways outside my hotel? Well, I could step out on my balcony and look down, and the double-decker highway that stretched out to the horizon was a riot of green and pink and red because all of the supporting columns were wrapped in ivy and vegetation. And along the highways, separating the lanes, and along the sides were beautiful flower boxes. Along the walls of the city park, where old people gathered at night to waltz in the moonlight and to do Tai Chi by the water features in the morning as joggers passed during the day, I noticed that there were forward-thinking posters depicting the city of tomorrow with slogans about responsibility that each of us has to making a green, sustainable future. I don't want to exaggerate. China is filled with challenges and problems, ecological and political. But I saw these technologies and ideas and memes repeated even on the day I took the efficient underground metro system out to Shanghai Disneyland, which itself was employing the latest green technologies. Of particular note was the Autopia ride, which in the Florida and California parks still use smoky fossil fuel burning cars, even though it's supposed to be Tomorrowland. My Imagineer friends at Disney told me that they've been pushing the idea of replacing them with clean, silent cars for years, but the American audience actually wanted the smoke and the noise to make the experience feel exciting. In Shanghai, the cars that kids grow up riding in at Disneyland are clean, silent electric cars, and the lines are just as long. That's the China I got to know, a place where people are literally lining up to participate in the clean, green future. It has a long way to go, but with China recently declaring that they intend to be carbon neutral by 2060, they may just be able to get there. The CEO of the Puxin Biogas Company, Dr. Jianan Wang, took one of those great bullet trains up to Shanghai from Shenzhen to present with me at Into USF. And he took me one evening to see how Shanghai had transformed. We rode a boat on the now clean river, walked on vibrant boardwalks. We visited the colonial era section and we went up tall buildings to look down on the gleaming city from on high. And he said, you know what I like about my country? We're committed to our progress. We suffered a lot. Communism didn't work. The Great Leap Forward was a leap backward. Agricultural collectivization, a failure. Many, many, many people died. The one-child policy was done in bad ways. There was oppression. But still, and still today we have problems. But still we learn from our mistakes. And what guides us is a vision of the future that is better. And we know we all have to act together to make it happen. I think we can get there. Most of us are very proud. We have long memories and we want to work together to cooperate to make it better together. Inspiring words. China and the other Eastern countries are fascinating because they blend ancient techniques and the most modern technologies. East Asia is the world's largest mass manufacturer of high-tech equipment, of computers and semiconductors and sensors and cell phones and such, so they can more easily employ drawdown solutions like smart thermostats, drawdown number 57, which can by themselves reduce CO2 by 2.62 gigatons at a negative cost of negative $74.2 billion with a net savings of $640 billion. Just as I saw inexpensive solar electric panels under every window in those skyscrapers of some of those buildings in the new cities in China, they can also outfit those buildings with electrochromic smart glass, drawdown solution number 61, reducing CO2 by 2 gigatons at a net savings of $325 billion as it regulates the amount of light entering the building adapting to the levels of sunlight, reducing heating and cooling costs, and lighting costs. Where the U.S. and the West gave up most of its manufacturing, preferring to focus on financial services and other digital goods, on creative design and mass production of grains and weapons, but now was reliant on high-tech imports to adapt to the future, the Eastern countries, with their manufacturing occurring close to the points of use, is actually in a better position to implement drawdown solution number 45, building automation for cities, reducing CO2 by 4.62 gigatons and a net savings of $880 billion. It isn't hard to see how Xi Jinping 
can boldly claim that China, quote, will have CO2 emissions peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060, end quote. China is currently the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, just ahead of the U.S., but it's an industrial powerhouse already way ahead of the U.S. and the rest of the world in things like high-speed rail, which is drawdown solution number 66, and electric bikes, drawdown solution number 69, and is so confident about their own prospects for a circular economy that they're completely, completely shutting down the import of materials, what we call garbage, from other countries. Indonesia is soon to follow suit. And neighboring Taiwan has emerged as the world leader in drawdown solution number 55, household recycling, estimated to reduce 2.77 gigatons of carbon at net savings of $71.1 billion. So when you put all these drawdown solutions on the table and, and add them up, you see why the Far Eastern countries, which are building new cities every day and can take advantage of postmodern industrialization, are feeling so confident that they can get to carbon neutrality. While the Far West, which has invested so heavily in fossil fuels and the legacy industries that use them with abandon, still feels the need to call climate change a hoax, a Chinese hoax, and delay the transition. It used to be that we were ahead on the Kuznets environmental curve and felt confident of our leadership as other nations struggled to catch up and excused their pollution and environmental degradation to do so. Now we see that we're actually behind and are lobbying to be permitted to do more damage in the name of making America great again. We have a lot to learn from the history of development, not least of which is that we need to improve our education system so that Americans can become innovators and implementers, producers and consumers of goods that endlessly recycle in the circular economy, not the cowboy economy. In the spaceship economy that Nobel Prize winning economists like Kenneth Boulding all extolled. The type of economy that all nations must ultimately implement on spaceship Earth. And just as E.F. Schumacher learned in Burma, and I learned from Bunker Roy in India, and I continue to learn from Dr. Wang in China, we have a lot to learn from the East and a lot to implement in the West, not the least of which is a renewed appreciation for that ancient Eastern idea, the idea that, in contradistinction from the anti-ecological individualistic competitive notion that the world can be divided into two camps, into winners and losers, into the fittest and the maladapted, into white and black notions of worthy producers and parasitic consumers, we must adopt the Eastern idea that actually every mouth born does come with two hands to feed it and comes with two eyes to see the future, two our ears to listen to others, and a great brain to process all that input. It's time for us here in America to become that integrated, cooperative, e pluribus unum nation of prosumers that uses a new appreciation for feng shui principles of balance with the proper use of wind, water, and sunshine to blur the fictive lines of longitude and erase these constructed ideas of East and West and get into coherence with ecological rather than political realities. Let's get to it.